Greetings. I'm glad you're, you've tuned in for the message for the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, January the 31st. Let us join together in our call to worship. Your part will be on the screen. Come to worship this day. Bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Jesus will offer hope. Come to worship this day believing in the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus will bring us healing. Come to worship this day feeling the presence of God. Jesus will teach us new ways to live. Amen. Let us pray together. Eternal light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal pity, have mercy upon us. That with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy to your holy presence through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our lectionary text this morning is taken from the first, first chapter of Mark and it's verses 21 through 27. This is God's word for us. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by, by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. All the people, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is God's word for us. Let us respond first of all in our silence. Amen. It says in the passage that he taught them as one having authority. And we can see that Jesus has authority when he teaches. It was the custom, as you would teach people, to say, Rabbi Gamaliel says, or Rabbi Eliezer says, or Rabbi Chia taught. But when Jesus teaches, and we have this in the Gospel of Matthew, that section of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you've heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye. But I say to you, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you. Jesus pointed to himself as the authority. He didn't point to, rab to the other rabbis. He pointed to himself. And so when he taught, they would say, what teaching him with authority? It wasn't just how he spoke, but it was who he claimed to, uh, to rely upon for his authority. But I say to you. And we see that Jesus has authority in his teaching, but he also has authority in his actions. That he has authority, as we see in this passage, over the powers of evil. Here is the man that is demon-possessed, and we're not going to get into whether or not uh, what's described as demon possession was actually mental illness or whatever. Uh, that's not the point. The point here is that whatever it was, Jesus offered liberation to this man. And we would agree that there are powers and principalities of this world, that there is great evil among us, 
And so Jesus shows his authority by how he taught, what he taught, and what he did. And the demons ask him a question. And in the Greek, it just is translated, what of us and you? That's a great question. What of us and you? You see, the mission of Jesus was to bring about the defeat of sin. And what fuels sin is evil. The mission of Jesus is to fight against those principalities and those evils, those powers that rule, influence, and motivate the world. Those forces that bound people up into sin, that bound them into destructive behavior, those forces that bind and steal and kill. From Jesus' mission, the demons have to go. And we are reminded that it's not only Jesus' struggle, but it is our struggle. It's not only Jesus' mission, but our mission. The the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians, his letter to the church at Ephesus in 6.12 writes this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now folks, we understand there is real evil in the world. The mass shootings that we see happening... I turned the news on on Thursday or Friday, or Friday, and there was just one murder after the next, one shooting after the next in Pittsburgh and surrounding areas. And one of the things that people ask, especially with, their, with, with, with mass shootings, why did the person do it? What was the motivation? Why? And it's almost as if we can understand why, that maybe the world will make sense. Well, folks, we understand that the powers and the influence of evil and the spiritual forces of evil and the, the authorities and the powers and the dark world of evil don't always make sense. Over 40 years ago, there was an elementary school shooting in San Diego, California. Two adults were killed and eight children and one police officer was wounded. The violence shocked the nation. This incident was before Columbine and Virginia Tech and Sandy Hook. The shooter was a high school student named Brenda Ann Spencer who lived across the street from the school. The only explanation she ever gave for committing the act was this, I don't like Mondays. That doesn't make sense. I don't like Mondays so I am going to torture, I'm going to kill, I'm going to harm other people. There is a senselessness to much evil. People do not act sensibly all the time. So there's a senseless evil, but there's also, we have seen in our history, there's an evil that has a plan. Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich, their purpose was to annihilate and purify During this period, Germany attempted to exterminate the Jews, the Slavs, the Romani, and even the mentally handicapped. Estimates suggest that more than 16 million people were exterminated by the Nazi government before World War II came to an end in 1945. Before that, in the 17 and 1800s, Our government engaged in genocide by attempting to kill off Native Americans and take their land. And then we see evil at work in the world. There's evil just for evil's sake. Just because the opportunity raises itself or or, or the opportunity is, is taken advantage of. There's evil for evil's sake. Chaos. It's sort of like those who are engaging in a protest 
going along with the crowd whenever there's someone in the crowd that just says, it's okay to break into these buildings and loot. It's okay to break into, uh, into the capital and to kill a person and to fight against those who would oppose them. If you will, there's evil for evil's sake. Hell for hell's sake. Again, Ephesians 6.12 For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. The question asked by this man's demons is also a question that is asked by us. What of us and you? What of us and you, Jesus? What have we to do with you? The Apostle Paul understands that a person comes to Christ by leaving everything behind. He writes in Corinthians, you are not your own, you have been bought with a price. So when we've done that, when we have given our lives to Christ, we have done that. There is no more us and you. What about us and you, Jesus? It's just you. It's just Jesus. It's no longer us. It's no longer me. And our baptism Vows give us an indication as to what is expected of us when we follow Christ. When we follow Christ, one of the things that is expected of us that we articulate in our baptism vows is this. The question is asked of those being baptized, do you accept the freedom and the power God gives you to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Because injustice and oppression are just two of the ways and two of the things that are influenced and moved and fueled by evil in whatever forms they present themselves. Sometimes evil presents itself in a personal way. Looking at the Ten Commandments, there are those commandments that deal with an individual and the individual's relationship with God. There's, 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 there are commandments that deal, that, that deal vertically, and there are commandments that move horizontally between a person and the world the person is in. And some of those commandments are these. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet another person's possessions or relationships. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, talk about the evil acts of our sinful nature. In whatever ways they present themselves. Evil, oppression, injustice. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, writes Paul. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Now, maybe Paul comes a little closer to home. Some of the things perhaps that we have engaged in. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Factions. And envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That we are to fight evil, even when it pertains to us. 
cleaning house, so to speak. That is, it is wrong to be engaged in hatred and it's wrong to engage in discord and in trying to, to create chaos and disunity among the body, especially in the body of Christ. Jealousy, selfish ambition, dissensions, creating factions in whatever forms they present themselves. Their evil presents itself to us personally, and then it presents itself to us as a society, the place where we live. There are systems of injustice that we are called to speak out against, that we are called to fight against, as Jesus' mission is our mission. A while ago I spoke about the process of redlining that the federal government and lending agencies engaged in in, in the 30s. It became illegal in the 70s. But the federal government and also lending agencies would literally draw a red line around a map and they would say if anybody wants to buy property or anybody in that area, if they want a loan, we will not give them a loan. It's a risky area. And most of the times they went and they looked at the map and they said, These are, this is the place where people of color live. Black inner city neighborhoods were most likely to be redlined. Investigators found that lenders would make loans to lower income whites, but not to middle or upper income African Americans. Racism. Treating people differently because of skin color. And it happens everywhere from police treatment to the jokes in the church foyer. And the question is asked of Jesus, what of us and you? Again, the Apostle Paul, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. Jesus' mission is our mission. The church isn't just about buildings and choirs and hymns and sermons. It's also about the prophetic voices in protest lines and legislative sections and courtrooms in checking out and checkout lines in stores and food bank lines in parking lots sometimes the mission field is personal the church's mission extends into the living rooms and the kitchens and the bedrooms the mission happens on school buses and in classrooms traffic jams and workplaces The mission of the church reaches wherever the people of God happen to be, whether face-to-face or virtually, because the principalities and the powers of this world and the spiritual forces of darkness are boundless and never tiring. The Gospel writer John understands Jesus as light shining in darkness and the darkness not being able to overcome it not being able to put it out that light as we read today shone for a man in a synagogue in Capernaum and the light shines today when those held captive by mental or physical illness are healed, it shines when oppression and sin are called out and the light of liberation begins. Now I understand you may not be politically active or politically inclined. And you may not move in social justice circles. But nonetheless, all of us have a duty and an obligation according to our baptismal vows to reject and resist wickedness, evil powers, injustice, and oppression wherever and whenever it presents itself. Even one candle in a dark room casts a light. And never underestimate the shining power of your light lit by the glow 
of Christ's light, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for staying with us. Thank you for uh, checking the video out. Thank you for uh, being a person who desires to have more of God in his or her life. Thank you for being a person who desires to be about the mission of Christ. Thank you for allowing God to work within you. Thank you for giving your life to Jesus. Engage in his mission. And now, uh, my friends, receive the benediction, the blessing. And now, may the peace of God, may the righteousness from God, may the power and the insight from the Holy Spirit, and may the liberating force of Jesus Christ bid us go to bear light in darkness, to resist evil, and to bring about that day of the Lord. Go in the knowledge, the love, the communion and fellowship from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. God keep you in love with God and in love with your neighbor. And God keep you safe. God bless you.